You're watching a video created by Schweitzer United Methodist Church in Springfield, Missouri. Thanks so much for watching. I'm going to tell you a story. A story of people walking in darkness, searching for light. A story of those living in deep darkness, longing for the dawn. A story of nations crying out, for the harvest is scarce and the battle is lost. A story of storms, of valleys, of deserts. A story of hope, though the people believe that hope is far gone. This is a story of God, His faithfulness and love. Though the people believe it's always winter and never Christmas. Well, friends, good morning. My name is Spencer. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be reading from John chapter 4 today. We're going to be wrapping up this series, Always Winter, Never Christmas. Uh, the last week of the series, because Tuesday, yes, Tuesday's Christmas Eve. I'm, I'm like over the moon. I can't wait for Christmas Eve. One of the best days of the year. Hopefully you've been inviting people. There's cards in your bulletins you can use to invite folks. Um, people are, are so open to invitations this time of year. Another great way to invite, we've been talking about this throughout the month, inviting, inviting, inviting. Another great way to do this is to share the event on Facebook. And so that's an easy way you can do this as well to help spread the word. Uh, we we want to invite people because we believe that God has something for everybody. And as they come on Christmas Eve, I think God has something for them. Whether they're uh, brand new to faith or have been walking with the Lord for decades, I think God has something for everyone that night. And we want um, to share this good news message with as many people as we can. And so I'm um, hopefully taking advantage of that. Uh, this is our last week of this series, Always Winter, Never Christmas. That line, if you're not familiar with it, it comes from a C.S. Lewis book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And uh, to me, I wanted to use this because it's just such a fantastic line to how a lot of people feel about Christmas. Now, not everyone, of course. There's some of you who just like love Christmas and everything about Christmas. The Christmas movies, the Christmas sweaters, the Christmas cookies, the Christmas lights, the Christmas decorations, the Christmas trees, the Christmas, 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 Christmas. You just love it. Everything about it, you just love it. And there's other people that when they come to this time of year, they just have a sense of dread. Because for them, Christmas is not the most wonderful time of the year. Christmas instead comes with tension and grief and pain. And they think about the family gatherings where people don't get along very well. Or maybe someone's not going to be there. And it, it just fills their heart, not with a sense of joy, but with a sense of, of dread of, of what Christmas is going to be. And so for this Advent season, instead of sharing stories of angels and shepherds and mangers and stars, which we're going to do on Tuesday. But for, for Advent, we wanted to read a different kind of stories because we wanted to speak into this, this sense that for a lot of people, Christmas is a time of dread. And so we wanted to speak into the, this, this kind of place for a lot of people. And so we're reading stories through Advent where Jesus meets with folks in scary, difficult, uh, challenging kinds of places. And so we started this out and we, week one was Jesus met with his disciples in the midst of a storm. And uh, we talked about how the winds and the waves were raging and Jesus shows up and in the midst of their fear of the storm, Jesus is there. Uh, week two, we looked at this, uh, this time where Jesus is not just on the mountaintops, but he's also in the valleys. Jesus is not just with us when life is going really good, he's also with, uh, with us in the lows of life and, and how he's with us both places. And, and we want to talk just to affirm the idea that w even when life is hard, Jesus is still walking with us uh, through those darkest valleys. Last week was the cantata, of course, and Music Sunday, just a great, great Sunday. And then today we're going to wrap this up uh, by looking at uh, a desert, storms, valleys, and deserts. And this desert we're going to look at, is not a, it's not a literal desert, I, actually it is a literal desert because it's Israel and like Israel is a desert. But it's more a metaphorical, uh, we're going to call it a spiritual desert, where Jesus is, is meeting with somebody in the middle of a, of a spiritual desert. And so John chapter 4 tells the story. Uh, we're going to just work our way through this story. It's, it's just an incredible, incredible word. I want to offer you just um, a word of hope for anyone who might find themselves in uh, what we're going to call a spiritual desert. So here's how it goes. John chapter 4, we're going to read uh, 26 verses here, so quite a bit. But here's, here's how the story goes. It says, now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples, because Jesus is good at management. So verse 3, so he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Verse 4, now he had to go through Samaria. 
Let's just pause for one second here. Samaria. What do we know about Samaria? Samaria. You might, you might think about the, the Samaritans, the Good Samaritan. The, this famous story that Jesus told about the Good Samaritan, the, the, the unlikely person who helped his enemy. And, and so for, for us, a lot of people today, they hear the word Samaritan. It's a good thing to be a Samaritan. It's, um, you, there's charitable organizations that are named after Samaritans because it's, it's become a good thing. But in Jesus' day, in the first century, to be a Samaritan, of course, was not a good thing. It was a bad thing. Jews and Samaritans are they're, they're enemies, and, and they're enemies because the Samaritans think that they're children of Abraham, and the Jews think they're children of Abraham, and so they're, they're enemies because they, they don't think each other are children of Abraham. Does that make sense? It's almost like a racial thing where they, they don't like each other based on, on the heritage that they have and, 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 and that, that dynamic, so that they're enemies with one another. So if we were to read verse 4 as a first century Jewish person, you don't read, well, Jesus had to go through Samaria. You need to read it more like Jesus had to go through Samaria. Emphasis on the word had. Like this is a, a choice of like last option. Jesus had to go. That's how a first century Jewish person would have read this. Kind of like my children have to clean their rooms. It's not that they want to clean their rooms. It's the option that's the last available option. That's how a first century Jewish person would have read this verse. Emphasis on the word had. And so therefore, if you were a first century Jewish person, red flags should be flying up as, as you read this because Jesus is going through Samaria, which is like, a, uh-oh, what's, what's going to happen here? Verse 5. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sukkar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph, which is a reference to the Old Testament, Jacob and Joseph and the patriarchs. Verse 6, it says, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Let me say that differently. He sat down by the well at the hottest part of the day, heat of the day. Jesus is there at the, the heat of the day. And then verse 7 says an interesting line. It just says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, which is an interesting line because this is not what should have been happening at noon in the heat of the day at this well. Uh, people don't come to the wells to draw water at the heat of the day. They come in the cool of the day the mornings or the evenings. And, and on top of it, it's not just that she's coming to the well at a weird time of day where most people don't do this. She's also coming to the well by herself, which is another thing in the first century that women don't do. Uh, women are the ones who usually drew the water and would go to the wells and draw the water, but women would go in groups to draw the water because the wells were usually outside of the villages. They were, they were dangerous, and so they'd go in groups. And uh, as they go in groups, either in the morning or in the evening to get water, here is this woman who is by herself coming to draw water, which is questionable. Why, why is she doing this? Well, let's hold on to the detail. We're going to learn more about her. But uh, that's a strange thing that's happened, and more strange things are going to keep happening. So Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Verse 8, a little commentary, John says, his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. And so Jesus, by himself, has this woman who comes by herself. And then Jesus does a remarkable thing for the first century. He talks to her. Now, obviously for us, that's not an odd thing, but for them, it was a very odd thing. There was a, a rabbinic saying in the first century around the time of Jesus that for a man to talk to a, to a woman was to, quote unquote, bring evil upon himself. Like this is the, the culture that upstanding Jewish men don't speak to, to women who aren't their wives. And here's this woman who's by herself, he's by himself, and he has this conversation. And on top of it, he asks her for a drink. And if you think about what you might know about uh, ancient Judaism, uh, they're generally pretty particular about what they eat and drink from. It's called being kosher. They don't want to share utensils and that sort of thing. And here he is asking her for a drink. There's so many odd things that are going on in this story. So many little details that we, we seem to keep, keep holding on to because they, they teach us something here. So verse 9, the woman, she, she gets how strange this is. So, so, so it says, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? She doesn't get this either. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Well, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Living water, it means um, like spring water or river water, water that's, that's moving, not, not, not water that's in a well or a cistern. And of course, Jesus isn't just talking about river water. He's talking about something much deeper here, which goes right over her head. Verse 11 Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did all his sons and his livestock? And Jesus is like, well, actually, I am greater than Jacob. Actually, I am going to do more than he ever does. But instead of saying that, he, he says this, verse 13. 
Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water, this well water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This is the the living water that he offers. Well, verse 15 says, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Well, he told her, go call your husband and come back. She said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Now, let's pause for here for just another second. She has uh, this woman who's coming here by herself to draw water in the heat of the day, not in the cool of the day. And, and what we just read here is probably a clue of why she's doing this. Uh, this woman, you can imagine, lives in a small village. And if anyone is anyone here from a small town, who's ever lived in a small town where word travels fast from house to house about everyone knows everyone else's business? It, it's not hard to imagine that this woman lives in that kind of environment where everyone knows her business and she, they know her history and they know what she's, she's been. She know, they know where she's done. She know, they know they've been through serial marriages and that she's on her sixth man and the man isn't her husband. And, 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 and this is a reason why probably for her that she has been cut off and, and that she's been, been maybe ostracized from her community. And so therefore she doesn't, isn't included with the other women. She's not able to come and draw water with the other women because she doesn't have relationships with them. And so she's off coming to the well by herself in the heat of the day, maybe just maybe to avoid other people in her life. So when we talk about spiritual deserts, we're, we're starting to see what we're talking about here. Because, because here's a woman who, who has a thirst within her, a thirst that uh, Jesus is offering to quench, something that she's been looking to quench, this thirst that she's been looking to quench in all of the wrong places. She has this history with men that she's been seeking to quench this deeper thirst in her life. And, and, and here's this woman now, because of her history and her past, she's also lonely and she's, she's isolated and, and here she is all by herself, and she's, she's living in what we're going to call here a spiritual, a spiritual desert. Well, it keeps going here. 19, Jesus calls her out and talks about this history that she has. And so, sir, the woman said in verse 19, I can see that you are a prophet. Like, duh, yes. <laughs> Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. I, I love that little detail. Because what she just did there is what so many of us do. I've seen so many people do this. I've done this. I bet you've done this too. Um, A conversation gets difficult and personal, and it starts to name some of the things that you need to deal with in your life. And what do you do when those conversations turn like that? Uh, We're going to talk about something else now. We're going to change the subject is what she does. And so she changes the subject. And so instead of talking about the the past that she has and the junk that she's dealing with and what Jesus just calls out to her and the things that she's done that she shouldn't have done and and all that that past and said, she's like, no, we're going to to go over here now. And she wants to talk about this this division between Jews and Samaritans. She wants to talk about the, the religious differences that they have. And so she's like, you know, let's change the subject. Jesus, where do you think I should go to church? That's what she does here. Verse 21, woman, Jesus replied, hey, he says, hey. Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship worship in the spirit and in truth. In other words, Jesus is like, listen, listen, listen. You, you want to talk about where to go to church. You want to talk about religion. You want to talk about what's dividing us. You want to talk about politics. You want to talk about all these other things. But, but listen, lady, I have what you're looking for. I, I have the thing that actually will satisfy you. I, I can deliver you from this desert. Like I am what you, you need. I, I, I am it. And so verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. And, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then 26, Jesus declared, he says, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Which which I think Jesus actually said it more like, it's me. That's what I think Jesus actually meant when he said it like that. It's it's me. I'm the one you're looking for. You've you've tried to live in all these other ways. You've, You've tried to quench your thirst in all these other ways. But listen, I am the one who can satisfy the cravings that you really have. This woman, she's isolated. She's lonely. 
She's filled her life with, with bad relationships. She has a history and a past. This woman is what we call, um, she's living what we call a, a spiritual desert. She's living in a spiritual desert because she has, has been living in such a way that, that her life has a sense of emptiness and it has a sense of void and, and, and she is not thriving. We call it a spiritual desert because when you live in a spiritual desert, you, you are not thriving. Life does not thrive in deserts. And God's will for us, God's will for you, God's will for me is that we would thrive. Is that, is that we would have a fullness of life and, and, and deserts are places where life does not thrive and yet what, what Jesus offers us is a life that does thrive. Think about the promise that Jesus makes in John chapter 10, verse 10, famous verse. Jesus makes this promise. He says, a thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Other translations of that same verse call it, um, have it to the abundance or have abundance of life. That this is why Jesus has come, that, that we might have abundance of life. Now this, this word here that's been translated as full from the Greek, this word here is a consistent word that is used throughout the New Testament to describe the quality of what a Christian life is supposed to be. Let me show you some other, word, what, other places where this word is used, and it's been translated differently, but it's the same Greek word that's at the root of all of these places. And so let me just show you this word and how it's used in different places in the New Testament. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, to him who is able to do immeasurably more. In the Greek, that's the word full or abundant that we read that, that Jesus offers us, this full life. So him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is work within us. Here's another one, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. It says, God is able to bless you abundantly. That's the word again, abundantly. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Ephesians 1, here's another one. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished. That's the word there. The same word that's translated as fullness or abundance. Now he's lavishing. He's giving us so much grace that it's just an abundance of grace that he gives us. He lavishes it on us with all wisdom and understanding. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5, for, for just as we share abundantly, that's, that's the word there, in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds in Christ. I love this one because even when you suffer, the Bible's like there is an abundance of comfort that can come your way. There might be an abundance of pain, but there's also an abundance of comfort that comes through Jesus. Here's, here's another one, Romans 5. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. I love Romans 5, verse 17. For if by the trespass of the one man... We're talking about Adam and the sin that Adam sinned that, that spread to everybody. So for if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Now, I could go on and on and on with verses like this because there is this consistent and pervasive message in the New Testament that the Christian life is one of abundance. It is one of thriving. It is one of blessing. It is one of goodness that is being poured out into our life. There is a consistent and persistent message in the New Testament that the followers of Jesus are going to experience a thriving in their life, which is why we call it a spiritual desert. Because when you're not living in that abundance, you're living in, in the void. You're living in a place where life is not thriving. You're living in a place where, where life is, is, is not teeming and you're living in a place where, where things are empty and, and where you don't have the abundance of what Jesus himself offers to you. Now, I'm gonna be really honest with you here. I write my sermons uh, three-ish or so weeks in advance and I have struggled with that last point for the last three weeks. And, and I've struggled wondering, do I really wanna say that? Because there's a part of me that when I say this, that it's God's will that we have thriving and abundance and, and fullness in our life, there's a part of me that hears that and thinks, oh, that sounds like the prosperity gospel. But, but it's not the prosperity gospel. There's a part of me that thinks that. And I, I'm like, oh, I don't want to say that because it sounds like the prosperity gospel. Is that what I'm, what I'm really trying to say? And so um, I'm in a, a small group gathering with other pastors. There's three of us in this, uh, we call it a band meeting. I know many of you are in band meetings. And if you're not familiar with what that is, it's, it has nothing to do with music. It's actually... It's about sin, not music. So it's like, it's, 
It's not, that, not as much fun as it sounds and where you, you confess your sin to one another. And I'm in this band meeting with uh, three other pastors. One's in Oklahoma, one's in Texas, and I'm, I'm here in Springfield, obviously, and we meet um, on our computers once a week on, on Tuesday afternoons. And, and uh, this last week, I was having a conversation with my band meeting, and, and I was just giving an update of where things were at, and I, I, they asked me specifically how Schweitzer, and so I was talking about Schweitzer, and I, I shared with them how um, things at Schweitzer are going, like, really, really well, like, better than I thought they should kind of well. I don't know if you ever have that. Like, like I was like, man, attendance is, is growing. Quarter four has been incredible with attendance. Our finances are great. We've had new members. We're, we're baptizing people. There's, uh, there's this like graciousness from the congregation towards me and my family as a new pastor, like far more than I expected there to be. And I, I told my friends in the spam, it's like, part of me is just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like just around the corner, there, there's, pro, there's gotta be something that's coming and I just don't know what it is. And I'm like, when is that gonna happen kind of thing? And, and one of my friends, he, uh, you know, we're on the computer, but he's like, hey, Spencer, do you not believe God is good? Do you not believe that God blesses you? Do you not believe that God wants good things for you? And, and he said, you know, we have this like, this disdain for the prosperity gospel, but just because you affirm God's goodness doesn't mean you affirm the prosperity gospel. And, and I was like, oh my goodness, you're, you're totally right. And for me, I've been wrapping this up and like, I, surely something bad is gonna happen soon instead of realizing, no, it is God's will for blessing. It is God's will for thriving. It is God's will for abundance and fullness that this is what God wants to do. This doesn't mean I affirm the prosperity gospel. It means I affirm scripture that this is what God wants for me. This is what God wants for you. He wants you to thrive. He wants your life to be full. He wants you to have abundance. He wants to do immeasurably more as we read in Ephesians. This is what God wants to do for us. And so friends this morning, I know that in a room this size, that there will be some of us who are living into that promise, but there'll be others of us who when we think about our lives, we feel like we're more like the woman who Jesus met at the well than we are living a life of thriving. Because for some of us, if we were to look at our lives right now, thriving is not necessarily how we would describe our lives. It, it's not full of abundance and joy. It's not full of, of blessing. Rather, we, we, if we were to look at our lives, we're like, man, my life feels more empty than it does full, hopeless than it does hopeful, depressed, joyless. My, my life, and I've, been, I've, been, I've got things in my life that, that you know, if I was to be honest with you, there's, there's, there's all kinds of, of struggle that I'm, that I'm dealing with during this time. And so for some of us, it's, it's not a life of fullness. It's a life of, and thriving. It's a life of, of a desert where, th where thriving is not what's taking place. Maybe there's all kinds of ways this takes place. Um, a lack of joy, um, stress, Maybe some of us are worn out and we're tired and, and we don't know how we, we're gonna keep going. Some of us might be dealing with depression. Some of us might be dealing with relationships that are just struggling to hang on. Maybe marriages that are just like on the brink. Maybe there's addictions, there's secrets that no one knows about. These are common things that, that people go through that, that steal the thriving that God wants for us. Maybe some of us are just skimming through life. We're just, we're just kind of on the surface of things and relationships or with our relationship with God and we're not really going deep or growing in this. We're just kind of skimming along the surface and, and what we're really living within is just we're living in a desert. We're living in the absence of thriving and the absence of life and the absence of blessing and the absence of joy. And so for anyone here this morning who might be in a desert, I, I wanna offer you a word of encouragement. And, and I, I can't tell you how to get out of it because there's not like three easy steps that you can take to get out of a desert if you find yourself in one. It doesn't work on a formula system, but, but rather what I wanna offer you is, I just wanna offer you a word of encouragement that, that there is one who excels at bringing people out of deserts. Th there is one who loves to offer living water that there is one who can satisfy every thirst that you have, that there is one who desires for you that your life would be full and blessed and abundant, that there is one who wants to give you this gift that he has offered to the world, that there is one who, who, who wants to do this and can do this, that this is what he excels at and this is what he desires for you. And I, I just, I wanna encourage you with this word that, that if your life feels empty, if you are without hope, if you are depressed, if you lack joy, if you are lonely or isolated, 
if you feel like things are empty or meaningless, that there is one who can provide you everything that you're looking for, and his name is Jesus. This is why he has come. This is the promise that he gives to you. This is the hope that we have of Christmas, that our lives can be blessed in this kind of way. And so a few hundred years before Jesus was born, there was a prophet, his name was Isaiah. And Isaiah offered this glimpse of what this Jesus was going to do. And, and in one place, he, he offers an invitation that I want to end with this morning, an invitation to anyone who might feel like they're in a desert because their life is not thriving. It's an invitation that comes from Isaiah chapter 55, and just it's an invitation to come to him, to take whatever it is that's going on in your life and to offer it to him, to take your life, the circumstances of your life, and to put it in his, his hands and to, and to give it to him in trust. And the invitation of Isaiah 55, here's how it goes. Come, all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters, you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on, not, on what is not bread and your money or your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. A promise of Jesus written hundreds of years before he was born. An invitation for us to come and to bring every part of our life, every relationship in our life, every dry part of our life, every challenging part of our life, every good part of our life, and to lay it at his feet because this is what he can do. He, he can help us. He can bring us life and living water given to you. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much that your gift to us is life abundant, life satisfied, life that is thriving and full. And, and we want to claim your promise this morning that this is what you can do for us. And for anyone here this morning who would say that their life is less than that, that their life, they're not thriving right now, there's loneliness or emptiness or meaninglessness or, or depression or relationships that are struggling, Lord, we can take these parts of our life and we can offer them to you and come and, and drink from what you have for us. And so, Lord, for some of us, we need to name very specific things that, that we're struggling with and we need your fullness to come into our life. And for others of us, maybe some of us who have never confessed you to begin with, this morning could be a chance for us to claim this promise that when we are filled with Jesus, that we have what we need. And then we confess our sin and believe that you are alive, that we find salvation and fullness and wholeness in you. And so God, today, uh, we just thank you that what you offer us in a relationship with you, it's so life-changing and it's so soul-satisfying that it's everything that we really need. It is the living water that makes the deserts teem with life. Thank you this gift that you have given us in your son, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. You've just watched a video created by Schweitzer United Methodist Church in Springfield, Missouri. Check us out online at sumc.co. And if this video blessed you, be sure to share it with someone else. Thank you so much for watching.